Hello, I'm Maria from Sew Through Time, and in this week's video in my series, Becoming a Gibson Girl, we'll be talking about makeup and ha hair of the Edwardian era. For this video's purposes, when I say Edwardian era, I mean the first decade of the 20th century, even though actually part of it is still in Victoria's reign. But fashion-wise, the first decade is very different from what came before and what came after with its S-bend pigeon-breasted silhouette. In this era, makeup was still considered somewhat of a taboo, but they did talk about making up their faces, but that did not necessarily mean what we would assume with makeup. That also included skincare, by the end of this era, in 1909, Selfridges opened the first makeup counter where women could openly buy makeup and try product on before buying it. Before this, makeup was sold and other beauty products were sold, but they were mostly sold underneath the counter when women specifically asked for them. And a lot of it was also bought through mail order catalogs because it was not considered something that you would talk about in public. It was considered kind of a lady's secret. When Selfridges opened their beauty counter, it really slowly started changing ideas of makeup and what, whether or not it was appropriate to wear because it became public all of a sudden. Before this, makeup was a woman's well-kept secret. So, First of all, the key to everything was good skin care. They very much embraced the idea that if you take very good care of your skin, you're going to have perfect flawless skin. And they have plenty of manuals on how to care for skin, not only with creams and lotions and things like this that we would recognize today as like toners and moisturizers, but also they had a lot of how-to tutorials, how to wash your face, how to scrub your face, and how to massage your face. It was considered something that every woman should do to keep up her appearance. You, it was considered womanly to try to look your best. Letting oneself go was not frowned upon in society. Now, when we start with an Edwardian makeup, the one of the key elements to this are different kinds of face powders. They had also body powders. Some were scented, some were tinted, some were tinted close to your skin so that you could at least potentially hide some blemishes because blemishes were considered unsightly as were freckles. Some were just pure white and the idea was to brighten your skin tone. You could also have purple, very lightly tinted purple, like this face powder here. It is tinted with lavender. And the idea is that this will brighten up your complexion. So if you have a little dry, dull skin from the winter maybe, or just age, then this kind of powder would have been promoted. Also, there were pink tinted powders and yellow tinted powders, whatever suited your complexion and would enhance your natural beauty. They didn't have actual foundations yet. So to start our makeup routine, we'll first put cream. They would have used cold cream, but I'm just putting a regular thicker moisturizer because I don't have cold cream right now. And the idea was that of course, before this, you'd wash your face and possibly put a lotion on, like we would today, put a toner. And the idea is that because the cold cream is a thicker consistency that you don't actually leave it, let it completely soak in. You have to have a little bit of moisture left on your face so that the powder sticks to that.
and then you powder your entire face. After powdering your skin to make it smooth, then we would take some blush that could be in powder form or rouge in liquid form. And and the idea is just to give yourself a healthy glow. Never have so much that people can actually tell. It's supposed to be like yourself, but better. Lots of, especially Victorian advertisements will say that this is the kind of rouge that you can put on and not even your mama will know where the girl ends and where the magic begins. Now, also they would add a little bit of blush on your chin, nose, middle part of your forehead, and on your earlobes. And the idea behind this is that these are the areas that would have a natural flush to if you had been, for instance, outdoors, exercising, and breathing in fresh air. And that is the whole idea behind Edwardian makeup, is to look fresh and young and as if you had just come from the great outdoors. Next, we put on the eyebrows. The idea was that you would enhance what you already had. The ideal shape was somewhere between a modern wingtip shape but and the earlier crescent shape, but it wasn't it's not as fit, uh, thin as 1920s. It's not thin like that. It's not drawn looking at all, but it is not super thick either. Now, since I have fairly thin eyebrows and quite light for my hair color. I add quite a bit of color to them. In the manuals, they say that try not to overdraw your eyebrow shape, if at all possible. So they do kind of Recognize the fact that not everybody has perfect shaped eyebrows, but they warn you that it is very easily artificial looking if it is against bare skin where there are no hair. Next, eyes. Now, they didn't have yet proper eyeshadow or even strong eyeliner yet. But what they would do is use the same powder or whatever they used for shaping their eyebrows. And they would put a little bit at the base of their lashes. The idea is not to have a really thin, uh, thick or thin line there yet, not a strong line, like you would think in 1920s, for instance. The idea is that it's more just enhancing your natural eyes beauty by darkening that lash edge there. <laughs>
Again, the key is to have nothing that anybody can notice, but just to bring out the eye's natural shape. And then they did have things to blacken their lashes, so I'm just using a modern mascara. But if you do use a modern mascara for this era, you want to make sure that your lashes don't look like they have mascara on. Nothing thick, nothing that shows any kind of clumps, and as natural looking as possible. Nothing super volume boosting or lengthening or anything like that. And again, instead of focusing on the ends of the lashes so much, focus really on the roots. And that's where you want the most color because that will make that line between your eye and your lid much stronger. The beauty ideal of the time was dark eyes. So that's why if, if we can't change our natural eye color, but we can darken the surrounding. Next for the lid, since we're doing an evening look, we're gonna put a little bit of gloss on the part of your eye that is visible. a little bit on the lid and then maybe a little bit in the corner there. The idea is just to enhance your eyes so that they shine more in candlelight. Now for the last bit, lips. They didn't have yet lipstick like we do that came, you know, in the cylinder. Their lipstick came and lip gloss and rouge it came either in liquid form or, you know, in a little tin similar to what you would get a lip gloss or a lip balm nowadays. Only the very bravest used a lot of color. A lot of girls would just put lip gloss on. But since I'm not exactly a young girl anymore, and I do want to reshape my lips a bit, I'm going to use a liquid rouge for my lips. Now what I'm using is actually accurate, but it's really just food coloring. But the Carmen Red that is very common in food coloring also happened to be very color oh, popular as a rouge in there. So instead of any, making anything fancy, I just used store-bought food coloring. Now they would have done this by hand, most likely, or using a small ball of cotton if they had that or something like that. But because I, as a modern woman and as a makeup artist, I'm used to using a brush, so that's what I'm using. And again, you don't want a really like strict line and you don't want it to look like, ooh, she's wearing lipstick. You want a really natural look, just like, you want it enhanced. Do you want it to look like 
Oh my gosh, can she really have that dark lips? <gasps> oh, wow. And again, like I said before, glosses were and balms were really popular. So you do want to add a little bit of shine. Not like a bright lipstick shine, just like that they look moist and healthy. Because the whole idea of Edwardian makeup is the idea of youth and beauty and health. Next up, hair. Especially in the first part of the decade, hair tended to be really big and there was a lot of different pompadour styles. Pompadour basically is referring to that big bump in the forehead area that could either be just there in the forehead, it could rise a lot or just a little bit, or it could extend to the side or even all the way around like a halo. They had many different kinds of rules and guidelines as to deciding the hairstyle that looked best for you and suited your facial features, especially your nose and also your body proportions in general. I personally prefer having it quite big all around or at least on the sides a little bit. Otherwise, I don't know why, but for some reason I feel that if it's just here in the front, it messes up my facial proportions and I don't know. I just don't like it that way. Anyways, so what I'm going to be using today is just a huge hair donut. This is actually my 1770s donut that I would wear for one of those conical going up styles that doesn't like tilt anywhere, just goes up. But... I can use this also for the said wordian. So yay, bonus, two different decades and centuries even with one hair filler. So first I curled my hair. I did a wet set a few days ago. And then I'll take the top part on your crown Remember to leave a good portion, especially in the front. And now my hair is naturally a little bit past my waist, upper hip area. So, and I have quite thick hair and there's a, quite a bit of it. So if you have thinner hair or much shorter hair, you will want to put all your hair down and divide it e evenly around your head. But for me, I can leave this crown top bit. And if you feel like you don't get enough in the, like to make a proper bun, you can totally leave this without a bun. But if you do want a top up bun, then you can do it with extensions. That's how they did it oftentimes too. But yeah, you wanna make sure that your face has a good bit of hair because once the cushion is in place, it's hard to pull hair out again. So like this bit here, cause that is thin there, that hair, I need to pull more hair out. Otherwise I'm gonna have a weird spot where that cushion shows. portion up with an elastic or whatever it doesn't really matter right now especially because you can always like redo it and then you just push the donut instead of having it like sit on top of your hair you want to push it up to your earlobes on the sides and to the crown of your head and to your, about your hairline. There are some rules in the Edwardian era that if you have a more prominent brow, then it should be a little lower. And if you had a more snub nose, then it should be higher and things like this. But you want to kind of experiment and see what looks best on your body and face. 
And then you just pin this donut into place so that it doesn't wiggle around or want to pop back up. I use bobby pins, but of course in the era they had just hair pins. And now, you kind of want to brush this a little bit lightly. If your hair stays better together with a bit of teasing, you can tease it a little bit or a lot if that's what your hair likes. My hair doesn't really take to teasing, so I tease it only lightly. It doesn't really help that much. And then... There. And then we just take sections. I usually take the front section first because of obvious reasons. I want to see what I'm doing. And then you fold it over. Now, really about, I don't know, how much is that? Like eight inches, 10 inches? That really would be enough to do this hairstyle. You do, of course, need more hairpins for this and then you'd need some, some fake hair for the middle bun. But you don't need longer hair than that. And even with shorter hair, you could do this with a smaller donut. Then you just pin it on. And you wanna make sure that the hair covers as big of an area of the donut as possible. You can just leave the ends hanging off the back We'll deal with them later. Now these pins we're putting past the donut, kind of into my scalp and hair. so that it will keep that hair in place there. Now they had also rules about, especially if you had a snub nose, apparently a fluffier, less defined hairstyle suited to you better than a really sleeked up thing. So you can have a lot of flyaways, that's fine. And that was actually at times desirable in the era. And it was never really required unless you were doing like Marcel waves and even that is kind of later. So it was never required to have, or even desirable necessarily, to have a super sleek, super smooth, finished look to your hair. Now at this point, because my hair is so long, it's starting to get kind of in the way. So I'll just turn the curls here to the front, and now I'll take a U-shaped bobby pin. I mean, not bobby pin, hair pin and just leave the hair. I'll, I want the bun forward because I want it to kind of frame my face too. Most of them were like that. I have seen some where it's lower and especially as the decade pro uh, progresses, the closer we get to teens, the lower and lower buns tend to be. This kind of hair would really have been at the height of the fashion in 1900, 1901, up until about 1903, maybe four. Then hair tends to start becoming lower.
And now the last bit of hair here in the back, I'm not gonna put a part of the main bun because I wanna use that to kind of cover up the hairpins here in the back. So I'm just gonna flip over the curls so that they go over the hairpins here in the back. I'm using the hairbrush to kind of smooth out everything and possibly help with hiding any bits that are still visible. This is why you want to color match it. You could also make one out of fake hair. Then you don't have to worry at all about it showing. Especially if you have thinner hair, you really want to do that. But also, it wouldn't have been something that would have caused a lot of comment even if your hair filler or rat would show a little bit. Now, when I have this ready, what I like to do, because I think it suits my face, is take it and tilt it a little bit. Now, if you're wearing a hat, you want to Think in what directions you can tilt it so that your hat still tilts in the direction you want it to tilt in. And then just grab a pin and just shove it into the rat or filler and it will keep, keep it in place. And there we go. And there we have it, the base of our look. Now, we would add the gown and possible jewelry, hair pieces, hair jewelry, whatever we wanted to this. You could add either a big bun here, or you can just leave it like this. Braids were especially popular. You could put a small braid here in the front or going all the way around. Now it's time to put on our proper underpinnings and put on our gown and whatever jewelry we want and head off to the party. See you next time. Bye.